right in um, kind of your, your best possible outcomes or any kind of input that you would like for us to be taken away during these uh, inner sessions. Anything else, Kevin, that you want them to have? Great. So again, if you do start to fall asleep, I noticed if you walk by the front door in the lobby, that'll be nice. <laughs> All right, so um, we're switching the order of our presenters here. Uh, Kiri Salmon with the Lambda Partnership. She's going to join us remotely. And Brad is uh, giving us. Ah, all right, yes. We got a connection here. So, um, so Kiri manages the Clean Water Program at the Lambda Partnership. Um, it's a conservation nonprofit that works across the Northwest. The work focuses on how nature can support clean water, finding new ways to fund restoration projects, and building partnerships to support lasting change in how we manage our natural, uh, how we manage our water and natural resources. So, if we have Carrie, okay, it looks like we have Carrie. So, uh, please welcome to Carrie's now. <laughs> Thank you. That sounds so loud through the microphone. It makes me feel really good. Um, <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for the flexibility and, and letting me present remotely. I I mildly resent the earlier implication that, that those that didn't make it in today might not be as passionate about green infrastructure. Um, as my car was starting to slide backwards down 42nd Street this morning, uh, I was remembering a Willamette Week article from last year, which I'm going to switch over to uh, for just a minute here. When we had two inches of snow and an average of five car accidents every hour. So I would just say that perhaps those that didn't make it in person are a bit more uh, automotively risk averse. And, and again, I, I really appreciate uh, your flexibility in, in letting me uh, do this from my house. And the last piece of introduction before I launch into it, I really appreciated uh, Sarah's comment earlier today about authenticity. And as I was sitting here, you know, arranging my webcam strategically so that you can't see any of the mess in my house uh, and, and trying to like taking off my dog's collar so she doesn't jingle it and you don't hear that while I'm talking. Uh, I just thought that I might A, reveal all of that to you um, along with a couple other uh, little little pieces of artifice. Uh, for example, uh, let me see if I can point to it. That cactus is dead. Uh, I, can, I cannot keep a cactus alive. I'm pretty good with plants, but uh, they they manage to defy me all the time. And then the last is a story about this cover image. I always love to include, you know, a picture of a watershed that people will relate to. And I had a really embarrassingly hard time thinking of a river that people from Oregon and Washington could both relate to. And I'm sitting there and I'm Googling the photos of the Nisqually and the Snohomish and the, the Rogue and the Umpqua and just thinking, shucks, you know, I, I really wish there was a, a river system that, that both sides could really relate to. Um, and eventually, of course, came up with the Columbia. So thanks for having me. Uh, and I will be there after lunch. So I look forward to, to meeting you all and having you here to listen to my three stories on integrated water management. And I hope that they illustrate the role that Willamette Partnership is playing, some of the work that we are doing to bring more and more effective use of natural infrastructure uh, and watershed approaches to the Pacific Northwest and beyond. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I say natural infrastructure, we're a conservation organization. And so the pieces we get most excited about are enhancing uh, natural river and stream systems to be more resilient and, and ecologically stable. Uh, well, that's kind of an oxymoron, but um, <laughs> enhancing natural systems. But those are going to live alongside our uh, concrete and steel um, and, and everything in between that represents the green infrastructure to gray spectrum. So that's why I'm, I'm uh, framing it as integrated water management. So I'll tell you a little bit about me, Willamette Partnership, and where we're coming from, uh, and then get into my three stories. 
So we are a conservation nonprofit. We're based here in Portland, and our mission is to increase the pace, scope, and effectiveness of conservation and restoration. We're primarily grant funded. We have a little bit, uh, maybe 20 some, 30% on fee for service contracts, a little bit from foundations, and then a, a tiny amount from, um, from individual donations and our fundraiser. And we work primarily as technical assistance and capacity support um, for other organizations. And we're almost always at this intersection of science and policy and people in place. And you know, as the kind introduction mentioned, you know, we specialize in articulating the benefits that nature provides and finding ways to make investing in the environment a good business decision. And for municipalities, for utilities, uh, that usually, or that in one of the ways that that works out is by making sure that we know enough about conservation, restoration, natural infrastructure, that it can connect to uh, regulatory compliance needs or that it can connect to the bottom line uh, for residents and for ratepayers. Um, we also often are working, thinking more on an individual parcel level, uh, be that residential or uh, a landowner in a forest or farm system. And I lead our efforts to take this approach to the water sector. And our work in water you know, is premised on that idea that nature is our original infrastructure and that our water infrastructure will work best when it works with nature. I uh, thought that point was made in the previous uh, talk as well. And when it works on a watershed scale. And those are the solutions where we really start to get these multiple benefits bubbling out that are economic improvement, that are social equity, that are um, wildlife and water quality and a general resilience that come from uh, natural infrastructure approaches. And one of the ways that I've been thinking a lot about recently and I'm going to be talking about today uh, is, is in part that, you know, we see that utility investments, municipal investments can be really transformative um, in moving towards that, that vision of a water infrastructure that works with nature and at a watershed scale. Uh, I imagined that I would go after Bruce, but I, I think now he'll probably make my point in the next presentation, you know, that it's not that every dollar, every tree, every action is happening, um, you know, from the, uh, from the funds or the resources of the utility, but it can really be a pretty foundational um, component to get a broader set um, of activity, um, be that through a collective action model, um, programs like Tree for All, et cetera. All right, so these are my three stories. And at the end, if I've done my job well, I can connect them all to you into a framework for how they add up to getting more natural infrastructure in the Northwest. And um, because, again, I, I really appreciate your patience uh, letting me speak remotely and letting me say things like policy pathways and regulatory frameworks and other phrases that uh, make my even people who love me very much as eyes just completely glaze over. Uh, I'm gonna try and do a couple favors for you. And the first is to, in each story, be really clear if there's one thing I want you to take away. And the next is that when we finish that story, you get to see a cute animal. So if at any point you're fading out while I'm talking, uh, you can think about this panda, or you can wonder which animal is coming up next uh, and then hope for the next story to be a little more connected to your work. But for now, the panda. And my first story is what uh, Derek had asked me to speak about originally, and, and I uh, convinced him that I wanted to tell the other two as well. But I'll spend a little bit more time on this idea of connecting stormwater and floodplain management, also because it's the project that's the most mature. Um, we actually wrapped it up in uh, this fall. So if you take away one thing from this story about connecting stormwater and floodplain management in Oregon, I want it to be that there is a report that is really easy to find on our website. And it's really easy to read. It's only about 12 pages. And the recommendations in there are really practical um, and pretty easy to implement. Uh, They're on a time scale of days to weeks uh, to years. So. And our partner in this effort was the Oregon Association of Clean Water Agencies, uh, Teresa Natin from the cities of Salem, Eugene, as well as Glenn Davis, and they were just wonderful to work with. And the process happened over the course of a year, and it started about 18 months ago. My colleague, Nicole Manis, and I 
were had this crazy idea um, <laughs> that she works a lot on floodplain management issues and and my work overlaps or or is directly involved in stormwater issues a lot and and we had this conversation you know just that's the same water right yeah it's the same water we're talking about the same hydrologic events rain falls runs over the earth carries things with it collects in the low points makes its way to the ocean yes okay we're talking about the same events and yet our universes as people who are working um, and playing supportive roles on these two issues were not overlapping. And so while we were sure that we couldn't be the first people to think that there must be efficiencies to come out of integrating stormwater and floodplain management um, and thinking how natural systems could support our resource goals on both, we got a small grant from the Oregon Community Foundation to explore that nexus and then work to bring those stories and examples uh, to others who also thought that this might be a good idea. And, you know, the timing also felt right. We, the National Flood Insurance Program was uh, potentially going to do some changes to how it was administered. And the phase two MS4 permit in Oregon was maybe going to uh, come out around this time last year. And uh, for any of you in the room who've been involved in that process, I can tell you that the National Flood Insurance Program uh, is in about the same state, uh, which is to say it's moving pretty slow uh, and, and hasn't um, uh, necessarily, its timelines have not aligned with ours as we might have hoped, but this project was still really successful because the stormwater and floodplain managers that we worked with were just incredibly motivated and smart and cared a lot about doing their jobs better and uh, this idea that water is water and and it makes sense to treat it that way uh, regardless of whether it was going to be incorporated in their permits so over the course of a year we spoke with individuals from 12 different uh, municipalities primarily in western oregon we are focusing on that nexus and that's uh, where most of our ms4 permits are and that was from really pretty small communities like cottage grove and turner you know up Salem, City of Eugene, uh, Clean Water Services, and the City of Portland, the counties, the floodplain managers that are associated with that. And we were asking them, you know, how does your program work? What drives it? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, are you overlapping with your co counterparts um, in stormwater to floodplains or vice versa? And what would make your life easier or uh, what helps or hinders your ability to do so? And we wrapped all that up into a draft report and then we set it in front of another 30, well, some of them were the same, uh, stormwater and floodplain managers in a workshop uh, this late summer, and really to push that into the recommendation space. And because I assume you remember my one thing, which is that that report is out, it's easy to find, it's easy to read, it's relatively easy to implement, some of them are more easy than others. Um, I'm just going to pick and choose from the barriers and opportunities that came out of that process. Uh, but it was it was a really great experience uh, and just a testament to the professionals in the state. So a few of the challenges. Uh, I feel like silos needs no introduction. And yet I could probably spend the entirety of my 25 minutes here talking about silos and kind of exactly all the forms that they end up taking. And uh, maybe the one thing I will say though, is that they are experienced differently by the small and large communities that you have um, someone like Amanda Ferguson in the city of Cottage Grove, who is the one person who is managing uh, stormwater and flooding issues and city planning and um, their tree program, et cetera. And yet she has to communicate to the different regulatory programs. And then you have the much larger communities where they have a lot of individuals within their stormwater program or within thinking about floodplains um, and development and, and zoning and city planning that need to talk to each other as well as to their respective um, regulatory counterparts. And those universes tend to demand different information. So what we know about best management practices uh, can be pretty skewed into those two silos as well. It sort of filters down into my, my second bullet there. Um, and then sort of filters down into my third bullet because those silos care about different ends of the wet weather spectrum. It is the same water, it's the same type of hydrologic event, uh, but a two and five and 10 year storm that we might be thinking about most often when it comes to stormwater, there's a bit of a gap there, right? Before the 50 or 100 year storm that we're typically thinking about when we talk about flooding. 
Okay. And we divided our, there we go, opportunities into two segments. So short term things that we could do right away. And then here are some of the longer term ones. A few that I'll pick out, I already mentioned culture eat strategy for lunch. Uh, and one of the ways that it seemed like some organizations had really overcome that cultural barrier was to take a watershed approach because watersheds you know, don't stay in silos. Uh, and so if you're coming at it from that mental space, you tend to need to go over and talk to someone else or think about how uh, floodplains are interacting. Um, and so, so it tended to support a more integrated culture that was looking for efficiencies at the, the intersection of stormwater and floodplains. About leadership, uh, it's, it's probably fairly obvious that if you have someone at the top with broad decision authority who is really bought in to the idea that water is water um, and taking a systems approach, then um, that's a great thing. Uh, but we were also struck by the examples of leadership at all levels. Um, and that feeds into my next point about navigating politics. The thing I liked here, uh, the lessons from those communities who were having success integrating and kind of busting their own silos internally to connect stormwater and floodplain management was that they had, there were two very different strategies. Uh, the first was to do a lot of communication, really focus on the business case, focus on the benefits to individuals, the bottom line in terms of dollars. And then the second was to fly under the radar and not talk about it much at all. And just start small, start by finding your counterpart, taking them out to lunch, talking about how to do the job you're already doing a little better, just getting to understand their language and what they do, and then doing little things together so that if and when the opportunity came to do something bigger or attention by electeds, directors, boards came upon your endeavor, there was this cache of success stories to say, we can do this, it's working and it's valuable. All right, um, moving on to some of the shorter term opportunities. I think they, they reinforce some of these other points I'm not gonna hit here. So these were, what can you do today? Um, or what can you do tomorrow, Friday, when you get back from this conference? Reinforcing that idea about um, shared communication and really focusing on communication and messaging. Um, for those that are in Oregon, the Clean Rivers Coalition is trying to do just that and provide some shared messages around water and watersheds and, and stormwater and, um, and behavior change. And uh, while I am plugging it, I'm, I'm not a direct participant, but Multnomah County is leading a strategic plan on that. And I've got the website at the bottom. Uh, so that's one way. The other is to take your counterpart to lunch. I'm assuming that uh, for those who are water resource managers in the room, they're probably skewed towards stormwater. Uh, so take your floodplain manager to lunch. When we hosted the workshop, we asked those we've been working with to bring their counterpart. And the majority did not necessarily know who that was or had not talked to them before. Um, so this is in the, these are in the start small category, uh, but really can provide, provide a good stepping stone to doing more. And then the last is totally self-serving, uh, is to disseminate the report uh, and, and check it out. And if 15 pages is too much for you, we also have a, a blog that has just uh, the, the kind of top nine things and, and goes into a little more depth on the examples I was giving. All right, so that's the first story. And as I shift to the next story, and I think the difference between the two is a little uh, higher functions and base functions, right? So, so integration and intersection and understanding these two sectors and then figuring out how to bring them together um, is like your critical thinking skills. And then uh, workforce development is a little bit like your basic functions. You know, do, do you have to go to the bathroom? Do you have enough water? Are you, are you warm and cold enough? You know, do you have your base needs met so that you can then go on and perform your your higher functions. So it's gonna be a bit of a shift, um, but before we get there, get this fox. It's pretty cute. Okay, so second story. This project is a little earlier on. We don't have any products or lessons learned, but we're a few months in and we're starting to get through the scoping phase. 
you know, my one takeaway here is that we're looking for stories. We're looking for feedback. And I'll give you a little bit more detail on what would be helpful and, and what I'd love for you to connect with me about. Our partners are Evergreen, uh, the Center for Sustainable Infrastructure in particular, and at Portland State, um, the Center for Public Service and, and Paul Manson. I know there are a few on the attendee list that were, were from PSU. We've really enjoyed uh, working with both of these organizations. And together, we're investigating the workforce-related barriers um, that utilities are facing today and anticipate facing in the future. Oop, got a little behind on my notes over here. And the reason that we three, amongst others, uh, this is funded by the Economic Development Administration, uh, care about this intersection of water and jobs is that they are very connected. Uh, for one, you know, jobs in water, jobs at utilities are good jobs. They aren't actually a huge portion of our economy, but they are important in many communities. And then they are also important because they're critical to economic, I mean, the affordable and reliable delivery of water and wastewater services, amongst others, are critical to economic stability and growth. Uh, I love this quote from George Hawkins. Uh, he's probably said it a thousand times, so maybe you've heard him say it too, but I uh, heard him at a, at a keynote saying, you know, when people ask me how many jobs I support, so was the director of DC Water, I say all of them. And they ask me how many lives do we support, and I say all of them. So there is this tight connection between water infrastructure and ecological resilience and community resilience. And we, what we want, um, what this project wants, uh, is to make sure that utilities have reliable, if not easy access to a talented workforce uh, that can deliver service and, and then be open to the higher functions, um, which are some of the things we're mo I am most interested in. Um, so caveat, right, this is bigger than natural infrastructure and, and green infrastructure. We're going to spend a lot of time thinking about operators and thinking about millwrights and electricians and the full suite of individuals um, who work in the water utility sector. Our scope is Oregon and Washington, and we are definitely focusing on the drinking water and wastewater sectors. Uh, we would love to be able to include uh, stormwater and flood management and potentially irrigation as well. Um, the workforces are a little different, so how we can set up our research project is 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 TBD. Um, but it's it's just it's bigger than natural infrastructure, but it's it's really important um, that we support uh, utilities. So over the next year, we're going to be working to understand what those workforce barriers are that utilities already face, and what are those that they might have on the horizon and recommend solutions in partnership with those organizations and really try to take into account where these different stories are coming from and where they're going to be relevant and therefore where different solutions are going to be relevant. Um, so it might be large and small, rural and urban, it might be about number of connections, it might be about the institutional structure, um, but being able to tell those workforce stories in that way and then go into outreach mode about a year from now again to talk about what we've come up with and, and continue to iterate to better and better um, and more shared and collective understanding of what we need to do. And this is where my ask comes in again. So we are in the scoping phase and we want to be able to tell, tell the story. There's, again, we're not the first ones to do this. The American Water Works Association, Water Environment Federation, it's a fair amount of work at the national scale thinking about the water workforce. But those stories start to break down when we get to the Northwest and when we get to the state level or we can get to individual communities. And so right now, you know, a lot of what I'm doing on this is reaching out and listening. You know, what are, what's the workforce story where you are? What are you worried about? Is it a way, is it retirement? Is it more automation and distributed or on-site systems um, and how to you know, staff or incorporate those? Is it about retention, um, you know, burnout or recruitment? Those are some of the things we've heard so far, uh, but are really interested to, to hear from you. So uh, please catch me this afternoon um, while I'm over at the conference. Um, email me, I'm really easy to find also. And, uh, and then if you would like, we can also sign anybody up. We're gonna have about six months, uh, every six month updates on this project and um, that we can get you hooked up with. 
All right. So that's my second story. And potentially my favorite picture because I do have a dog and I'm a dog lover. And my last story is about technical assistance and maybe a better word would be partnership or capacity support. As I introduce, this is what Willamette Partnership does, right? So I'm gonna talk about two opportunities that we have some resources to put behind, but we are absolutely, I mean, it's in the name, right? We believe in partnership. We believe that durable solutions happen through collaboration um, and happen through a diverse set of voices that are finding themselves in the work. And uh, so we are interested in, in partnerships much broader than these opportunities. But these are two where we have some grant funds to throw behind it and we have some uh, some resources to start the conversation. So the first is that we have a grant from the Bullet Foundation. This is for Willamette Partnership to provide capacity assistance and technical support um, to those who are working on integrated water infrastructure projects. And the geographic scope is that of the Bullet Foundation. So it's what they call the Emerald Corridor from Portland up to Vancouver. Some of the things that we are really good at are both the technical and social side of getting natural infrastructure programs up and going um, or getting something kind of over the hump uh, and, and uh, an idea that's been cooking a long time into action. So we can do the nuts and bolts of uh, program design and scoping, uh, visioning and brainstorming. We also have that quantifying of environmental improvement. If you do X, then you get Y on the landscape and connecting that to regulatory needs and then the social side around telling the story of what's happening and why it's important and building coalitions of support and collaborative efforts to get um, to get broad support for what we're doing the next opportunity oh and so this is again the emerald corridor um, research for the bullet foundation are uh, definitely through the end of the year and potentially through next year, we have uh, a fair amount of confidence and it's primarily for our Willamette Partnership staff time. And uh, we would love to, to have more conversations about um, if there's a good fit and if there's pieces that we can help with. Um, we, we have an agenda in that we would love to see more conservation and restoration, um, but we know that that works when it works for everyone at the table. My other example of opportunities for technical assistance that uh, could be as, as cheap as free is through that same partnership with Center for Sustainable Infrastructure and, and Portland State. In this case, uh, our funder has a focus on distressed communities. They have the definition up there, uh, greater than 1% uh, greater than the national average on unemployment or median income is 80%. Uh, and that could be at the city, county, or census tract level. And some of the services, if you will, that this partnership uh, brings are the same. Plus, with the three organizations, we have a broader reach and, and a broader network. And uh, CSI in particular brings some great skills around value planning and data visualization. And our work with Paul at, at Portland State University, I, many great things about most of the uh, all of those organizations, but the individuals that we're working with in particular, we've really loved um, the original research capacity that it's just a fun team uh, to work with. So that's my second opportunity. And with that, I wanna start wrapping up here and see if I can't knit these together into what some of our ideas are about how we get more investment into natural infrastructure in the Northwest and what some of the critical components are of where that works. So the first is a regulatory driver or any sort of, it doesn't have to be regulatory, but something that's a reason to act. Um, we don't tend to do much work in this regard. Uh, we don't you know, push for uh, permits or, or particular limits. It's more that we filter by them and, and tend to think that when someone has to do something, um, that's usually the time in which they're looking for um, new ways to, to meet their obligations. Talked about culture and champions. To me, this is where our workforce piece fits in. Uh, we would love to be through workforce development, building the champions of the future um, and finding space for those individuals in a Northwest water sector um, that is really strong and thriving and, and ready to meet future challenges. The clear path 
This is about knowing if you know where you want to get and you have a will, how do you do it? What's the way? And this is where the technical assistance piece in comes in. This is where the collaborative processes like bringing together stormwater and floodplain managers to share stories comes in. This is this is the guts and this is what I think we mostly spend our our time on, not just me and Willamette Partnership, but but as a whole, right, is, is the how um, and sometimes to the detriment of some of these other pieces. And then the last, I didn't have any stories today about the role of collective will. Um, I'm hoping that the collective impact story that you heard before um, and maybe some of uh, Bruce's discussions will reinforce this idea. Now, I'm not ready to say that you need a broad coalition of support to use natural infrastructure you know, in every scenario or to do something new and different, um, but it sure doesn't hurt. You know, in those cases where using natural infrastructure and enhancing our rivers and streams to be supporting our clean water goals is different, it's a different set of skill sets or, or it's a different way of an entity thinking about themselves, it's a little bit of a boulder up a hill or it can feel that way. And when we have all of our partners and stakeholders simply standing aside and not opposing, moving that boulder up the hill, that's a lot less useful than if they can see themselves in it and if they understand how their goals are achieved, how the multiple benefits of natural infrastructure can help them in what they want to do. And then you might get a few more hands behind that boulder with you. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and try to switch to my last slide here and your last cute animal for the day. Thank you so much uh, for having me and, and having me safe in my house. I look forward to meeting you all this afternoon. Thanks, Gary. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, I think we have a, a couple of minutes for, for questions. It's Bruce's good morning. So by the way, that person, oh, sorry. Hey, Carrie, this is Adrian from the city of Portland. And um, one thing that we're thinking about, I'm curious about the um, sort of the scope of the workforce being assessment. Something that we're talking about in our bureau a lot is equity. And so I'm curious if that's sort of on the radar and something that you're thinking about as you move forward with that um, work. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite okay. tell the question. I heard, I mean, I, I, I got some of the basics, but not kind of the, the core question. Basically, is equity something that you're thinking about when you're talking about the um, workforce needs assessment? Yes, uh, it is. And it is, I don't have a great answer beyond that at this point. Um, I have a, a lot of swirling thoughts um, about we've we've had a few conversations with those that you know say ecotrust um, that are thinking about workforce development in particular and um, uh, yeah I, so yes but I would love to have more conversations about it because it it isn't something that so far you know we've been hearing in the challenges from um, you know, kind of pre-interviews with those in the sector, but it's something that we want to make sure that we we bring in, whether it's through an investigation of um, what some of the particular challenges that might need to overcome are, or what some of the best opportunities in the development workforce development side are uh, to you know reach new communities and bring new voices into the sector. So thank you. I would love to follow up more. I wish I had a better answer at, at this stage. Okay, any other questions for Carrie? All right, Carrie, excellent job. You uh, gave us a yeah. lot of ideas in a very short amount of time. So <laughs> I'm glad I you didn't do what I asked you to do. <laughs> well, I thought if I put them into threes, they'd be easier to, to remember. But um, yeah, please would love to talk to anybody after if uh, I glazed over something that seemed pretty important to your work. Thank you for having me. All right, see you in a little bit. All right. Great
So um, our next speaker is uh, Bruce Roll. So that's who the Bruce uh, that's in Kerry was referring to. So Bruce is the director of watershed management uh, of the watershed management department and clean water services, and also the nonprofit Clean Water Institute. Um, uh, <laughs> Bear with me, and we'll address right, so that. Brad is, uh, so Bruce is also a founding member of the Intertwine Alliance, a key developer of the Tree for All Landscape Conservation Program. 